Hello students, this is Professor Sansom here to talk about Experiment 5, which is an introduction to chemical reactions. And one of the goals you have for today is making careful observations in lab of what's going on in your experiment. And it reminded me of this talk by Sister Burton from 2012. Um, first observe and then serve. She said, sometimes observing and serving requires great effort. It's not always convenient and doesn't always fit our timetable. As you observe and then serve, you are living examples of the Savior's teaching. And as much as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. And it's a wonderful talk, so you should go read it if you have a chance um, to remind yourself about observing and serving, being aware of the people around you, and helping make their lives a little bit better or a little bit easier. This experiment is really one of the most exciting and fun experiments that you'll do all semester. And one reason is because you're going to do a whole lot of different types of chemistry today, um, testing out a bunch of different kinds of reactions. But the reason that we're doing this is not just for fun, although that's nice. Um, it's because we really want you to think about what you see, which is the macroscopic level, and then relating that to what's happening at the atomic and molecular level. So as you look at the products of a reaction, being able to then think what's happened at the molecular level and how would I write this in a chemical equation. So as you're completing this lab, you'll also be asked to provide the evidence and reasoning that you use to link the products to your observations. We'll also ask you to write balanced chemical equations, and our process skill for today is information processing. And the reason we chose this is because the information you see is that macroscopic information, what's happening in the beaker, and you have to translate that into another kind of information, like a chemical equation or a description of the type of reaction. And so information processing is your process skill for today. There are five different types of chemical reactions that you're going to see today. Um, synthesis, decomposition, combustion, single replacement, and double replacement. I've put here a generic equation for each one um, with A's and B's and X's and Y's. And what I'd like you to do is take a moment to pause here and think to yourself, how can I distinguish between these if I were trying to decide what kind of reaction is going on? So based just on reactants, you can identify a decomposition reaction pretty easily. It only has one reactant. That's an easy way to identify the decomposition. If you have two reactants and their elements, synthesis is the most likely uh, candidate because it's when two elements react and form a compound. And uh, if you have one element and one compound, it could be single replacement. That's commonly what you see for single replacement. But it could also be a synthesis reaction where you have two different things that combine together to form some larger thing. And if both reactants are compounds, it's likely going to be double replacement. It could also, of course, still be synthesis, um, depending on what you see in the products. So those are some ways that you can think about distinguishing between these, even if you just know what the reactants are. Now in lab today, you're going to be doing a variety of different chemical reactions and some of them are going to produce gases. And because they produce gases, we'll want to characterize the gases that they produce. And there's three gases that you guys are going to look into today. One of them is oxygen, one is CO2, and one is hydrogen. And to test this, you're going to do a glowing and or a burning splint test. So a burning splint test is what it sounds like. You have a wooden splint and you light it on fire, like up here. That's a burning splint. A glowing splint is when it has been on fire and you blow it out and there's some kind of orange embers on the end of the stick that are still hot but not actually on fire. That's a glowing splint. And the way you test for these gases is if you have oxygen, it supports combustion. So you can put a glowing splint in a sample of oxygen and it will reignite. Um, and that's because oxygen is helping it burn. For CO2, you can put a burning splint into CO2 and it will go out because carbon dioxide does not support combustion. It's what's in common household uh, fire extinguishers. And the last gas is hydrogen. 
hydrogen is actually explosive, and so if you put a burning splint into a sample of hydrogen, it will explode. In our lab, it's a tiny little explosion, so it'll be more like a pop. As a note, you sometimes do hear a pop on this oxygen test with a glowing splint, but those are different because with oxygen, it's the glowing splint and it's reigniting and it might you might hear a pop as well. With hydrogen, you're gonna have a louder pop and it's gonna be the burning splint and that's the little mini explosion. So if you watch the other video that we have for you as the preview of this experiment, that'll help clarify um, what what you should what you should see for each of those gas tests. In your lab report, you're going to be asked to provide claim evidence and reasoning to support your conclusions in the lab. So a claim is going to be something like, I think this is a single replacement reaction. And the chemical equation is also a claim because you're saying, I think these are the products of this reaction. Evidence is going to be specific observations. So usually each substance has a specific observation associated with it. For example, when I put the glowing splint into this sample of gas, it reignited. That would be good evidence for oxygen. And then reasoning is how you decided on the type of reaction and the products of reaction. And it's going to include a reference to a chemical principle or a pattern. So we're going to show you a couple of examples here just so you can see what they look like. When I do this, I want you guys to actually try doing this on your own. And I'd like you to um, interpret this sentence here and then uh, try and complete this uh, bottom part on your own. So take a, uh, as long as you need to do that, you can go ahead and pause the video. Okay, in this example, we have solid sodium metal and it's exposed to green chlorine gas. The resulting reaction releases light and heat and produces a white solid that conducts electricity when added to water. This reaction is probably a synthesis reaction because I'm starting with two elements, sodium and chlorine. And my product here is just one thing, it's the white solid that conducts electricity when it's added to water, it's an ionic compound. So the white solid formed after the solid sodium was exposed to chlorine gas, and the solid conducts electricity when dissolved in water, which is consistent with it being an ionic solid. Our reasoning here is because we start with two elements, sodium and chlorine, it has to be a synthesis reaction and form a compound. And sodium chloride is a well-known white solid uh, made from sodium and chloride ions. Uh, it's also an electrolyte, which is consistent with our experimental results. Note that the reasoning is linking our evidence to our claim. Why does it matter that we have a white solid? Well, because the white solid could be sodium chloride and that is an electrolyte and that means it should conduct electricity. And that's a reason why we would have NaCl for the product. So if our claim is that we have NaCl for the product and we know from our evidence that it conducts electricity, well then we need to say how do those things relate to each other. We know sodium chloride is in fact a white solid that conducts electricity when it's dissolved in water. Another one for you to try out on your own. Go ahead and pause the video here. Here we have a strip of aluminum foil. It's added to a blue solution of copper 2 chloride. And in the end, we get a colorless solution and a spongy red-brown precipitate that formed. So this is a single replacement reaction. One of the reasons that we think it's single replacement is because we're starting with aluminum foil, which is an element, and then copper 2 chloride, which is a compound, and we're making two different kinds of products. And if we write the balanced chemical equation, it should look like this. And the blue color of the solution disappeared, so the solution became colorless. That's a sign that our CuCl2 went away and our AlCl3 was formed. The silver colored aluminum foil disappeared and then a spongy red-brown precipitate formed. That's gonna be our copper. So here in the reasoning section, we're going to relate the observations or evidence that we have with our claim of what the chemical reaction is. Because we started with an element and a compound, it makes sense that this is going to be a single replacement reaction. And um, when the aluminum replaces copper, we get colorless aluminum chloride. That's our colorless solution from our evidence. 
and a red-brown copper precipitate. So we're saying this is copper and it's a red-brown pre precipitate. And that's the element that's come out of our single replacement reaction. Safety in lab today is pretty intense because you do have a lot of chemicals that you're dealing with because you're going to do a variety of different experiments. So I'll just run through them for you. The first is magnesium. You're going to be using a magnesium metal and it is a flammable solid and you're going to burn it. But when you burn it, you need to make sure that you don't look at it directly. It burns very bright and it can cause permanent damage to your eyes. Potassium iodide, copper two sulfate, and hydrochloric acid are acutely toxic by ingestion, so be careful not to touch your face with contaminated gloves or eating or drinking in the lab or anything like that. Hydrogen peroxide, copper two sulfate, potassium iodide, and silver nitrate are irritants, and silver nitrate can stain your skin and clothing, so be especially aware of that. If you do get silver nitrate on your skin, any of these really, you should just wash them off. And um, the result, if silver nitrate does get on your skin, is that probably tomorrow you'll wake up and you'll have brown spots on your skin from the silver nitrate. So um, if that happens, uh, you can know that it was because of the silver nitrate. And also, it'll come off in a couple of days. Um, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide are corrosive and they can cause permanent damage to your eyes and skin, so be careful with those. Hydrochloric acid is also volatile, so you should use this under your fume hood or under your personal downdraft. Most of the experiments that you're doing today you should do under your personal downdraft. And because we're going to be working with flames today, if you have long hair, make sure it's tied back and also make sure that your lab bench is clear of any flammable materials. When you're lighting the Bunsen burner, you want to make sure that you light the match before you turn on the gas for the Bunsen burner and extinguish the Bunsen burner using the valve, not by blowing out the flame. Uh, your TA will demonstrate this for you um, in lab. And if you have questions, you can ask your TA about that at the time that you're doing it. Okay, that's everything. I hope you have a great day.